So I don't know about you, but I'm excited to not be doing a talk virtually. I am excited to be here in person and seeing you all, seeing your reactions. So let's talk about why most data projects fail and more importantly, how do you avoid this? So I don't know if you've ever went on social media and you've ever looked at, okay, why do social, why do, why do data projects fail? And they say, oh, you used Snowflake instead of Databricks. Ever seen that? Uh, or they said, oh, you didn't do Data Lake. You, you wanted, you should have done this. You should have done this thing. That, that was your problem right there. So then we have an issue of languages. Then people say, oh, oh, your problem was that you used Python or that you use Java. Oh, you should be using Rust now. Have you seen that? We should be using Rust for everything, just in case you didn't know. So are these the problems? Well, now let's back up and say, have you ever seen the statistic about 85% of data projects fail? And that brings us to some, some really sobering facts of, okay, so if we reverse that, if we invert that, that means that only 15% of data projects actually succeed, which is an incredibly, incredibly low number uh, to the point where you think, why should I even do this? Or for me, it's been the subject of my research for a pretty significant amount of time of me wondering, why is this so bad? What can we do to make this much better? And why can't we do much more things to improve the, the value creation with our data? So here is the problem. If you look at, the, at, at what people are saying about the technology, technology is important. Don't get me wrong. You do need technologies to do this. Without technologies, you're going to have to write this yourself. You're going to have to do something. It is really difficult. However, it is one smaller piece that's initially smaller but what you need to do is get the foundation about yourself, that it's an important part of your success, but it's that smaller part of your success. So what are the bigger, more initial parts of your success that you need to be doing? It's asking what are the, asking some initial right questions. Some questions about who, what, when, where, and how. If you answer these questions, a lot of those technology answers will actually fall out of this, where when you say who, when we say what technologies, oftentimes they're starting with several steps down the road when you should be actually starting with one of these initial questions. And then based on those, then you can say, oh, this is the right technology. So who? How many of you ever uh, have looked at your teams and at wondered, do we have the right setup for our team? Do we have the right teams? And that is an important question because there's a ratio to this team. How many of you are on a team of lots of data scientists to zero data engineers? That's a really common one. I see a few hands up. You know what that looks like? It looks like failure. You know why? Because data scientists don't have the skills to do engineering properly. They can do some programming, and that's nothing against data scientists. That's simply a statement of they've taken one or two programming classes. They've learned enough coding to just get by. They are not the people who do the engineering. Now, if we reverse that and we say, oh, we should have our data engineers do this data science, that's not what they're supposed to be doing either. The data engineer skills are much more around software engineering. They don't have that math background to be able to say, oh, this is what we should be doing. So we also need our operations people. How many of you are doing your own operations? We need to have some level of operations there that keeps this thing running. So we need to have all of these, th these three groups in, in the right ratio. So what, the question comes up here, what is the right ratio of data engineer to uh, as a data scientist? My general recommendation is a five to 10 data engineers per one data scientist. So this is a pretty significant inversion of what we generally see in the, in the industry. We see one data engineer trying to serve a group of data scientists of 10 people. And why? Well, we need that ratio because that's a recognition that the amount of data engineering that goes into these problems of doing machine learning AI is far more, far more intensive than what we have in terms of the data science. This is held out by even research papers from Google. I talk about it in a lot of my research. So getting that right ratio, that who, is really important. Sometimes 
companies will ask, well, what is the, what is the most important team? What is that one person I, I need? And that's a big problem because there isn't just one person that you need. You actually need several different people to do this right. You need three teams. You need data science, data engineering, and operations to do this well, to do this correctly. Each one of these is not more important than the others. Each one is required so that you work together and you work together well. I have other talks where I talk about what are the manifestations of one of these teams missing. And it kind of helps people understand, oh, if I'm missing data engineering, that means that my, my engineering, the engineering work that happens is never done correctly. Or when we're missing data science, I would go so far as to say, why are you doing data if you aren't applying the most advanced methods of using that data, of utilizing that data, i.e. data science. So there's some really key parts that we need for this. We move on to the next question of what. What is the business value of what you're trying to do? Out of curiosity, how many of you have identified this question or have an answer to this question? A few of you? So in an ideal world, this would be everybody, but so with the issue there is if you are trying to create a data product or you start to use data and you haven't identified the business value, sometimes what you'll get with, let's say, a board level mandate, some kind of C level mandate, they'll say, we're doing AI. We're going to get all the data and we're going to do AI. And they have read CIO magazine and they read a Forbes article that AI is the future and this is what we're doing now. And off you go. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but that isn't a data strategy. Uh, yeah, good thing she was sitting down when I said that. She would have fallen over, right, Jessica? So we should have a very clear path. So sometimes there's that issue of how do we get to that point? There is some learning that has to happen. But if we start hiring a 20-person team, a 30-person team, and we have zero path to value, I've seen this happen. I've seen it with larger teams in this, with zero path to value, zero business value, zero direction. These teams will have problems because having that data uh, strategy isn't enough. We need to have clear plans. We need to have clear execution. So guess what? We, when in the best of times, in the good economic times, we could always get by. We could always say, oh, well, we're, the company's making money. So now in an economic downturn, what happens? They start to look around and say, oh, look at that team. They don't really, they're not really generating value. So this is really key, I think. Key, especially now, if we, aren't, if we don't have a value generation, if we don't have a clear path to value generation, we're going to be potentially on the chopping block of, oh, there's this team of 30 people. They do zero. Okay, we don't need them anymore. Uh, I talk about it in my book of the worst question that, or the worst answer that you can get is if the business person, if you were to ask a business person in your organization, what is the value being generated by your data team? And they say, what data team? That is the clearest indication that you have generated zero business value. And that means that's a, oh my goodness, watch out, scary things will happen, Okay clear path to value, okay? Then we get to when. When are, you going to change, when are you going to generate this business value? This is actually an important part because sometimes people will try to say when it's ready. Or I've also seen uh, the field of dream style of create it and then they'll come. Have you ever seen that? Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna have this data lake and everybody will just come rushing to us because they'll hear about all of this data. So without this, clear generation of value, hey, uh, this when, when are we going to do this? This is key. If we don't have a when, there's no there there. When it's ready is a bad time frame. Because what we want to do, if there's anything that we could take out of this conference as data professionals, looking at, the, at some of the continuous delivery side, is that they're generating value constantly. If we're operating almost as a waterfall of a year-long cycle, two-year-long cycles, that isn't really generating this value. We need to do that. So the other side of that is sometimes we have this completely infeasible time frame. 
This is a time frame that's been generated or mandated by a board level, C level usually. And they say, we want AI in six months. That's a completely infeasible time, time frame. Um, and that's really where it's important to set some good realistic expectations with that C level, with that person, because they may have read a Forbes article. They may have been talked to by a, uh, by a company, a vendor, and that vendor says, oh, you use our stuff, you can be doing AI in a day. Yeah, just use our stuff, there you go. Uh, completely infeasible, but wrong. So here is why we want to do this. Uh, we're gonna get canceled if we don't, if we take too long and don't generate enough value. But more importantly, if we promise too much, promise too little, those are some other paths of, of failure there. So be careful about how you, what you promise and what, how you deliver on that. So where? Now we get into some of the technology side. Where is this data going to be processed? And there's quite a few different things. Are we going to use cloud? Are we going to use which technology? So what's key here is having a person or people on the team, actual data engineers on the team that can clearly tell you what are the technologies that you should be using. There's a big issue in data engineering right now, quite honestly, and that is the majority of people have either have no experience in this or it's too hard to keep up with because there's so many different technologies out there. And how many of you feel like this is happening of, oh my goodness, there's a new technology out there. What does this do? Well, there's a lot out there. So it's hard to keep up with them. It's hard to know what the right decision is. So these data teams, they need to have a clear architectural plan. Each piece is going to be done in this. Each part of this will be done in a certain place. Each part will be done in various ways. So very, very key that we, that we do that. So here is a common problem that I see, I've seen personally, and that is how many of you ever have ever uh, received, let's say from an architect, a data architect, here's the cloud vendors white paper, let's follow this. Any of you received that? A few of you, okay. Would you like to know what that looks like in two years time? It looks like failure. Do you know why? Because that cloud vendor does not know about your use case. That cloud vendor is uh, intrinsically motivated to have you use their stuff. Good, bad, or indifferent, they're going to have you use their stuff. So that's a, that's a key issue. And guess what? Those, uh, your, if you work with a vendor, your vendor is usually a, a salesperson and a technical salesperson as well. You usually have them in a pair. And do you know what their compensation structure looks like? Their compensation structure looks like you signing up and them getting a sale. So the issue there is they're convincing you uh, to use their stuff because they're financially motivated for you to use their stuff. They are not financially motivated for you to use the wrong, to use the right or wrong thing. They're financially motivated for you to use their thing. And this is where we get into problems of, oh yeah, you can do that with our thing. And then a year, two years from now, you'll find out, Oh, you know, it turns out that the backflips that you had to do to use that were just, it, it was not feasible. This is not the way to do that. So you, this is, this is an, a, a common place where, uh, where we were just talking about the number, uh, being able to keep a, up with all these technologies and all of the, these changes. The issue there is then we, turn, we try to figure out who to turn to. So we'll turn to the vendor. We'll turn to the cloud vendor. Uh, that cloud provider, and we'll say, oh, can you help me? Oh, of course they'll help you to use their stuff. Not necessarily the best thing to use their thing. So do be careful there and do make sure that you make some, do some checks. Try to figure out if this is the right tool for you or not. Now we talk about how. How are we going to plan? How will our plan be executed? So what we need to do is we need to have a clear plan of what we're going to do. How many of you have a clear plan of what you're going to do? So this, is, this would be a singular focus. I talk about really, really focusing on one thing. 
Um, this, I've seen this happen with many different data teams, especially those starting out. There is so many different ideas, so many different business units all talking to them at once. So what they'll do is they'll go in 20 different directions at once, trying to achieve value in 20 different ways. Do you know what happens? Nothing, Nothing ever happens <laughs> because there's a lot of problems to that. There's context switching. There is the business climate changes. And so that a thing that took so long to do, that caused the problem. So if you think of it as a concurrency problem, or you think of a thread, you know, thread starvation, you've probably heard that term. If you do 20 things, you're eventually going to hit some thread starvation. And then you go back onto that other thing, and you go back onto that other thing. And this is how data teams initially become un completely unproductive because they do 20 things at once rather than doing one to three things really well. And so that's really what I would strongly advise all of you to do is to get really, uh, get incredibly uh, focused on just those one to, two, one to three things. And that's really where we get, uh, uh, so the question would be, well, how do you get to those one to three things? This is where you start to think of, do, what is your, how is your relationship with your business owner? How is the relationship with the business side? Because the business side can usually tell you what the things are. How many of you have a good enough relationship? How many of you have ever stood in a room and said, what is the value of me doing this? How many ever done that? Nobody? One person. Kudos to you because this is something I actually do. I actually get the technical folks in the same room. I get the um, heads of departments in the same room and we go through the ideas and we go through the data. And not just that, we don't talk about it at a technical level. The business people, this may surprise you, do not care whatsoever if we're using Spark or Databricks. Do not care, do not care about Snowflake versus Spark, okay? They care about return on investment. They care of, if I do this thing, I will make 10 million pounds more. That's what they care about. And so if you don't put it in those terms, they will never care. So you need to say, okay, you have this idea about if we get our customer data, if we get a customer 360, you need to ask the very specific question of, okay, if we get a customer 360, what will that do for us? Will that allow us to sell better? Will that allow us to reduce our costs? Will that allow us to do this, that? And if you can get them to give you a, an, a, an estimate of what that can do, then all the people in the room, they can see this, this uh, overall view of, here is what, what each one of those data products could do. This is the amount of revenue it could generate. And then now what you do is you take the people, the, the technical people in the room, and you can try to figure out what is that trade-off of this will take a year, this will take one month. You can start to do that. And this is quite honestly, I've, I've done this many times. This is actually the most difficult part of what I do in my consulting is trying to figure out what is technically possible for the, for the team at the same time as finding what is the highest value. So this is a, an important, a really key point that you do that. So spend a lot of time, spend a lot of effort there because once you have this plan, then you can figure out how to execute it. And then you get that focus. And when somebody comes to you and they say, Jessica, why are you working on that? Jessica will be able to say, I'm working on that because this is going to save the, the company 10 million pounds. If you come back and you say, I'm working on that because I want Spark, they don't care about that. And this is what is going to be the difference, I think, for data teams that succeed, failure, uh, for companies that succeed and fail. Or when the chopping block happens, uh, you can say, oh, 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 you're going to take my team. Oh, okay, well, there's the 10 million that you said. So if we do that, you're saying you don't want that 10 million anymore. So a, a few things to think about that. Clear plans, clear directions. So don't get too bogged down. Fight a few wars, fight a few battles very well. Don't fight 20 battles poorly, okay? Focus, focus, focus. I'll give you a bonus question. And that bonus question is why? Why is your data valuable? How many of you have figured out what, uh, what is, why your data is valuable? Just one? Kudos, two of you, okay. I'm sorry? 
Information and knowledge, yes. So here is the problem about data. Eventually, you're going to have some bean counter, uh, an accounting person that says, our, our, cloud, uh, our cloud costs are 20,000. Our personnel costs are uh, a million, whatever it is. And they're going to say, uh, why are you continuing to do this? Why is this important for you to do? And what you'll need to be able to do is you'll need to be able to come back and say, we need to store this data. Let's say you're storing that data in S3 and that's costing you a thousand, two thousand a month, whatever it is. You need to be able to say very clearly, very directly, we are storing that data in S3 because the value of that data is this that there is an inherent and intrinsic value to that data, not just that we've, we're storing that because we may one day do something with it, it's because we are going to look at that ROI. So how many of you have actually calculated an ROI for your data projects? Uh, one person, so two, two kind of, so we'll call that 1.5. So this ROI is actually really key. So when I look at an ROI, I usually look for a 10x ROI. So put a different way is if you're going to invest a, uh, a million pounds into something, I would expect an ROI for, of about 10 million pounds. And we calculate that out because we would have had the business person in the room to say, oh, if you do this project, you will save, make 10 million pounds more. And the reason that you look for that 10x ROI in general is to make sure that if there's ever a, an accounting person that comes knocking, you'll be able to say, what we're doing is going to have this outsized effect. You look for outsized effects generally in data. And here's the, um, the other problem. Sometimes we'll have teams where we have a one-to-one -one ratio, where we're basically going to break even. Those sort of break even uh, teams are a problem because eventually that business person's estimate will be wrong. So you could actually be at losing. You could be losing money because although they said it's a million pounds, you could actually be losing money on that. So a clear, why is your business, why is your data valuable? That's really key. So when we, when we go to this, how do we start a project? We start by answering these questions. Then we start moving on to the execution. If, you have, if you're sitting there and you're thinking you're in the middle of a project, what I'd highly suggest you do is to go through these questions, make sure that you have clear, um, clear answers to each one of these questions, and then go to your execution. And then relook back at your execution because not having the answer to some of these questions could actually be the problems that you're having within your, within your organization, within your project. You may have a ton of data scientists, zero data engineers, and so all of your execution times are really skewed. It's taking you way longer. That could be the problem. So what you may have to do is you may have to circle back around, hire those data engineers, get those data engineers in place, and then that will start to, to uh, follow through and start to fix some of the issues that you'll see downstream. Well, another thing too uh, uh, that I think is key and not talked about, simply because it's kind of a hard fact, is not all gaps are technical. Sometimes the gaps are in people and technology. And this is a hard thing that I've seen in my, uh, in, in my consulting, and that is not everybody has the ability, quite frankly, to do some of this technology. Data engineering is hard. It's really hard. And so what you may hit is you may hit the ability, a gap in the ability of that person to be able to get to that next level. And that may be a, if you're a team lead, if you're doing that, that may be a tough call that you'll have to make. So you, if you are leading that team, you may have to say, hey, I'm sorry, or maybe you're, maybe you're better uh, used in another part of the company, for example. So do, do be careful there because sometimes uh, technologies or these projects, these data projects, AI, it's thought of or pitched by vendors as put my technology in place, put Spark in place, all of this other things flow out from that. No, it's actually an organizational, it's a skill, 
and it's a people change. So organizationally, you might just think it's, a, it's, a techni- it's an organizational of uh, people. We put some new people in, some data scientists in, some data engineers in. Uh, that's actually not true. There are changes within the organization of how do you even work with the data team? How do you even make sure that the business works? There's quite a few organizational changes that have to happen. There's this skill. There's these new skills that people need to do. If you decide you want to use Spark, for example, if you decide to use uh, Snowflake, whatever, those are new skills that you'll be expecting people to have. Make sure that you provide those people with uh, with the ability to get to that next level, to learn those new technologies. But I would say more importantly, remember that not everybody will be able to make that journey with you. This is actually a a key unfortunate part. Uh, I'll tell a quick example here. Oftentimes, data projects were put in the data warehouse team. Now, the data warehouse team is a, it looks like a knowing look there. (laughs) Yes. So the data warehouse team, I like, I will bluntly say is the team where good data projects go to die. It's unfortunate, but true. And it's not that the data warehouse technologies are bad. It's not that Snowflake is bad. It's a team, it's a people problem in my opinion. And it's a team of people who they're used to a very specific way of operating, a very specific way of dealing with problems, but they are not the team to do uh, AI projects. They are not the team to do these next level, next generation data projects. And that is a key problem. Uh, You can read uh, some of my books about this where I talk, if you need some help in showing this to a CEO board level, I have it there in black and white, very clear written for management, okay? Uh, Should you get help? So this is a a problem that I I often see. There's a lot of different possibilities of getting help. And sometimes companies will eschew that, thinking that they can handle all these things in-house. Not really, Not, not necessarily. So there's a few different ways. Outsourcing. If I go to a company and they have no software engineering background, this is not their, not what they do generally, probably better served outsourcing this, quite honestly. Uh, Technical consulting, that's another possibility. Management consulting. uh, Management consulting, I would say, be careful there because you could go to Bain, you can go to BCG, Boston Consulting. They have management consulting, but they've probably never ran a data project. And I think there's enough differences there, that mix of data plus software, is your average person cannot do your management consulting there. But of all the things I want you to take away from this talk, it's that these problems don't fix themselves. I have lots of data, watch this over over a long period of time. If there is some problem that you're seeing in that talk of, oh, that resonates, it isn't that the the problem works itself itself out over a year or two years. These problems never go away. It takes very concerted effort and usually that concerted effort has to start at the board or C-level to be a board-level mandate, a C-level mandate to be like this. Um, it is possible for a mid-level manager to push this, but usually it's, a, it's more of a downward thing. And, and so what really what I think t- teams need is the board-level, C-level mandate uh, cover or... Uh, buy-in, whatever word you want to use, I think it has to come from there because you're eventually going to hit problems that you can't circumvent. It will be an organizational problem. It will be a budget problem. It will be some problem like that where they, an example, a common example is, okay, we pay our people under market, let's say. This is a common one. Uh, They pay their people under market and they say, we can't hire a data scientist. Why can't we hire a data scientist? It's because you're trying to pay a data scientist under market and you can't find one. You will need board level help. You will need C-level help in order for them to say, okay, we will make this exception. But what often happens is that we'll say, okay, we'll do that on a case by case basis. And that makes you fail at hiring for example. That's just a common, that's a pretty common one. So make sure that you have that C-level buy-in. Otherwise, it will be this constant one-off and that makes you lose out on candidates. Uh, 
my book, Data Teams, if you'd like to read it, I go even deeper into a lot of the uh, subjects that I was talking about. Sometimes uh, there's, there's things that people need to see in black and white, quite, quite honestly. And so this book is for management. It's, it's for technical leads. It's a non-technical book, but that is what I wrote it for. This is for management. And there's things in there, for example, for HR. I wrote a section there for your HR people to say, this is why you do not think that data engineer is this and is a DBA. It's right there in black and white. So you can show them that. I know I've, I've hit that. It sounds like a few of you have hit that. I have it there in black and, black and white. And that allows HR people to say, oh my goodness, it's there in a book. It must be true. So there you go. Uh, the other part that I'm really proud about this is I didn't want it to be a theoretical book, although it's my experience. I'm writing quite a bit of my experience in there. I did pretty extensive case studies, and those case studies uh, went, went deeply into um, long-term companies. So companies with 10 years of, of doing this. Twitter, uh, I interviewed them, for example, for a case study to talk about some of the inflection points, some of those inflection points of what happens, what changes as you get bigger, what happens when the team doubles, how did you have to deal with that? Uh, another example, uh, Criteo, that's, uh, you've probably heard of Criteo or French company. Uh, what happened, how did they get that, that uh, relationship between the data warehouse team and their data team well? Uh, that was, was, was a really interesting one. So uh, you can go to datateams.io and get that, uh, get that book. So with that, uh, a big thank you to all of you, and I'll open it up for questions.